In this video, we'll compare the constitutive rule account of assertion and the intention-based account of assertion. As you saw in the Williamson, the constitutive rule account is the view that Williamson endorses of assertion. This view is quite like the conventional account in many ways, or at least on the surface they look very similar, so we have to do some work to peel them apart. The crucial question here is, what is the difference between a convention and a constitutive rule? There are, of course, some similarities. Conventions and constitutive rules might both, in some sense, be seen as something like a directive, or there are sort of if claims that if you, if you want to make an assertion, then do such and such. But actually, there are some really important differences between the two. The first difference is that conventions are changeable or contingent, whereas constitutive rules aren't. So remember the examples of conventions that we saw. So we looked at like weddings, surrendering, declaring somebody out in a game. So as a matter of fact, there are actually ways, there are actual particular conventions that tell us how those things happen. But we can easily imagine that those conventions could have been different. So take the surrender case. That's very, it's very easy to imagine here that the rules could have been different. Maybe it could have been a black flag or a red flag or not even a flag at all, maybe a sign or something. The conventions for when you surrender could have been very different. It's easy to imagine how they could have been different. In fact, the conventions seem somewhat arbitrary. This is not the case with constitutive rules, Williamson thinks. If something is constitutively a rule for a practice, then you couldn't change the rule without also changing the kind of practice you're engaged in. So if you think about a game like chess, chess has particular rules, it's natural to think maybe it's actually identified by its rules. And maybe if you change the rules for chess, so you change maybe how a pawn works, or a queen works, or how a rook works, You've thereby changed what game you're playing. You're not playing chess anymore, you're playing some other game. So, whereas with conventions, you can change the convention for surrendering, and it could still be the practice of surrendering. So how exactly you surrender is arbitrary, it's not essential to the practice of surrendering. This is not the case with constitutive rules. If something is a constitutive rule of the practice, then you can't change that rule without also changing what practice you're engaged in. The second difference concerns whether you can be performing the action even though you're not following the convention or rule. And here the different views give different stories. So on the conventional view, if you don't follow the rules, then you just don't count as doing the activity. So if I raise the wrong flag, or I don't say the right words in a marriage ceremony, or the umpire says, says the wrong words, they can thereby just fail to be doing the thing that we're interested in. They can fail to surrender, fail to marry, fail to eject somebody from the game. If you make a mistake in following the conventions, then you don't count as doing the activity. You are not successful in doing it. This is not the case with the constitutive rule account, because you can break a rule while still being engaged in the practice. So think again about the example of chess. If I cheat in a game of chess, does that now mean we're not playing chess anymore? It seems like the natural answer is no. Breaking a rule doesn't automatically mean you're not playing the game anymore. It just means you're not doing it properly or you're not doing it well, but you're still playing the game. And this is a crucial difference the views will have with respect to making assertions. Supposing that we could spell out what the conventions and assertion were, if I follow, failed to follow them, I would just not count as asserting in the first place. I wouldn't be asserting anything. This is not what happens when you don't follow the norm of assertion on the constitutive rule account. Williamson is not saying that if you say something you don't know, you're not making the assertion at all. Rather, it's like the chess case. If you say something you don't know, then you're not engaging in the practice of asserting properly. But not engaging in the practice properly doesn't entail that you're not doing it. You can do it badly as well as adequately. I think it's natural to think that the constitutive rule account is something of an improvement on the conventional account, because it's potentially very easy to spell out what the rules are. Indeed, Williamson thinks that he's done that. He thinks the rule is just assert only if you know. And so to be asserting, all you have to be doing is, engage, is being engaged in some practice where that's the rule that you're supposed to be following. Again, once again, it's helpful to compare this to the example of playing chess. There's no mystery as, as to what it takes to count as playing chess. It's just to play a game where the rule the rules you're following or the rules you should be following are the rules of chess. The same goes for assertion. To count as asserting, you have to be engaged in some practice where the rules governing that practice 
are the constitutive rules of assertion. So if you like the idea that assertion is maybe a sort of rule governed practice, then there's maybe something to be said for going in for the constitutive rule account rather than the conventional view. That being said, just because this view is an improvement on the convention account, it does not mean we've actually necessarily really been given any reason by itself to favour it. And in fact, Williamson, despite the fact he, wants, he says he wants to trace out the implications of giving a constitutive rule and assertion, doesn't really actually give us much positive evidence for thinking there's a constitutive rule of assertion. So one thing he says is that on his view, the point of assertion is to transmit knowledge. The reason we have a knowledge norm of assertion is because we want to take the knowledge we have and give it to other people. But just because the purpose of assertion is to transmit knowledge, it's not obvious that that is by itself an argument that it must be a practice governed by that rule. There are a few kinds of analogies you might think about here, but maybe think about gift giving. In some sense, the point of gift giving is to maybe not transmit gifts, but to, you know, in, in, in order to transfer gifts from one person to the other. That's the point of the practice. Does it thereby follow that there are rules in gift giving? It's not, not obviously so. Now, maybe there are some social rules about gift giving, but the mere fact that we're involved in an activity where you're transferring something you have to somebody else doesn't immediately mean that there are going to be rules on how to do it, or that it is a practice governed by the rule that says something about giving gifts. So you might concede that assertion really is about transmitting knowledge while claiming that this doesn't really give us an argument for thinking it's a rule-governed practice in the way that Williamson says it is. The second related point to make is that even if the practice is rule-governed, even if there are rules for how, how you should, you're supposed to do it, there's still a gap between this and saying it's a constitutive rule. It's not obvious that all rules are constitutive. Maybe there are rules for doing things that could be changed. In fact, that's probably how things work with convention. There are rules with, conven with conventional activities. There are rules for how to do them, but those rules could be changed. If rules divide into two categories, the constitutive and the non-constitutive, we need some argument to think that the rule of assertion is specifically constitutive and not one of the non-constitutive kinds. And it's not really clear if Williamson has actually done this, whether he's given an argument which shows this. Finally, we can just think about sort of interesting cases. So. Maybe as a matter of fact, what we do is we, we do actually try to assert only things that we know. But we can imagine just a different community of people who work in a different way. Imagine there was a community of people who, rather than saying what they knew, in general said what they justifiably believe. According to Williamson, a community of people who go around saying what they justifiably believe is not a community of people who go around asserting things. Rather, it's a community of people who go around doing something similar, but not quite the same as asserting. It's not really clear though, if you think about contrast that community to our own, even if you accept that what we do is we assert things that we know, that there really is a difference of what we're doing. There's at least some temptation to say both our actual community and the imagined community are asserting things. It's not that I'm doing one thing, assertion, and they're doing this other thing. Again, this is not a knockdown consideration, but it's just some illustration of the fact that it's not, you know, even if we think that knowledge is actually what governs our practices. It's not obvious that it's constitutive in the way that Williamson wants. The last kind of account we're going to consider is an intentional account of assertion. And this account is adapted from the Strawson paper that we read. So as you'll have seen, the Strawson paper is not directly about assertion. What we're, we're going to do is translate some of the claims that he makes about illocutionary acts into one specifically about assertion. In fact, I did a version of this earlier when I was discussing the problem with the conventional account. The intentional account runs with the idea that when we assert things, what we're trying to do is get people to believe what we're saying. That's the guiding idea of the intentional account. So on the intentional account, we might say that an assertion, very roughly speaking, is an attempt to get your audience to believe the thing that you're saying. So if I assert that it's raining, I'm attempting to get my audience to believe that it's raining. Now this by itself can't quite be the definition of assertion for the kinds of reasons that Strawson discusses. In particular, it doesn't capture the fact that assertion needs to be transparent in a particular way that isn't captured by just this simple definition. 
there are lots of ways to get people to believe things. And some of those ways don't look like communication at all. Rather, they look something more like, let me say, deception or manipulation. So a very simple case we can think about is, imagine that Alice, Billy and Carol are all at a party. And Alice has made Carol promise not to tell Billy that she's at the party. So Carol has sworn not to tell Billy that Alice is at the party. But nonetheless, Carol wants to share this information with Billy somehow. So what she does is, she waits until Alice and Billy are both in the same room. Obviously Alice is at the other side of the room trying to avoid being seen. But what she does is she turns to Billy and she says, who's that over there? Looking in the direction of Alice. Now what she's doing is she's intending and she has full knowledge that once she asks that question and Billy directs his attention, he'll spot Alice and he'll thereby come to believe that she's there. He'll come thereby come to know that she's there, in fact. However, it's pretty clear that we want to make an important distinction between what's going on in this case and what's going on in the case of assertion. In this case, Carol is clearly trying to get Billy to believe a certain thing about Alice. Is she thereby making an assertion by asking the question, who's that over there? Clearly not. Is the thing that she's doing even really all that similar to assertion? Again, we want to say that, that there's an important difference between, between what she's doing. The kind of thing that she's, she's start trying to manipulate Billy into having certain kinds of beliefs. She's trying to get him to have it without making obvious that the, her own intention for Billy to have those beliefs. In this case, it looks like she's trying to hide her intention that Billy have those beliefs about Alice. That's not what goes on in the ordinary cases of assertion. Rather, when we assert things, not only are we trying to get people to believe things, but it's kind of open in that the fact that we want people to have those beliefs is, is obvious, it's transparent to those involved in the conversation. So clearly, if we want to spell out this idea that assertion is intentionally sharing your beliefs with others, there's got to be more involved in than that. It's got to be more complicated. So Strawson suggests one way in which we might spell it out, and it is somewhat complicated. So what I'll do is I'll divide it into two parts. I'll first say that on the intentional account, or on the Strawsonian intentional account, you assert P just in case you say P with the complex intention for your audience to believe it. Now, what is a complex intention? The thing I'll call a complex intention is an intention that has the four conditions that Strawson lays out, some of which he's taking from Grice. So the first condition is that you have to intend for your audience to believe P, but you also have to intend them to recognize that you want them to believe P. Furthermore, you want their recognition of your intention to make them believe P to be a reason for them to believe P. You want the case to be such that if if they can see that you want them to believe P in the basis of what you said, they think, oh, that is a good reason for me to come to believe it myself. Finally, we might say you intend them to recognize your third intention. So we've had three intentions, the intention for them to believe it, the intention for them to recognize you want them to believe it, the intention for them to think that you're wanting them to believe it is a reason to believe it. Finally, we want the audience to recognize the last intention we made as well. So this is rather complicated. The reason why it's rather complicated is that if you work through the various cases, you'll see it's hard to spell out exactly what this idea of transparency amounts to. So you might have originally thought in response to the party case that not only do you have to intend the audience to believe it, but that you also just want them to recognize your intention. If you think through it, you'll be able to see that there are somewhat more complicated cases you could cook up to show that even those two won't be sufficient. For this reason, Grice, who Strawson is drawing on, drew up these three conditions. But Strawson also shows in his paper that you can even come up with a further, more complicated kind of counterexample, which requires um, the fourth condition. We won't, in this lecture, get too much into the details of all these different kind of counterexamples, but it's worth thinking for yourselves if you could come up with them yourselves. C try to reconstruct for yourselves the reasons for having all these different sorts of conditions. But as I say, we'll come back to it. Um, and in particular, we're going to come back to it when we start thinking about Stalnaker. 
It's worth saying at this point, these rules probably are not by themselves going to be sufficient. Once you start getting the knack for generating counterexamples, you could see that maybe you can come up with counterexamples even to these four conditions. So the complex intention that we're talking about probably will have to be very complex indeed. And as we'll see when we talk about Stoliker, Stoliker actually endorses the idea that the intentions involved here have to be very, very complicated. But anyway, this is, you can get, hopefully now you have the feeling for how the intentional account of assertion is supposed to work. The idea is that assertion is all about trying to get your audience to have the same beliefs or to have the same knowledge as you do, but you do, you intend it in a rather special way where not only do you intend it, but it's sort of, that intention is sort of transparent in a particular way to you and your audience. I'm not going to get so much into positive arguments for this view here. When we spell it out a bit more next time, once we talk about Stoliker, we'll compare it. We'll look back and we'll compare it to Williamson's account. But one thing I think it's worth noticing straight away is that unlike the Williamson view, the intentional account of assertion puts the communicative role front and center in the definition of assertion. Williamson had this conception of assertion as a rule-governed practice, where we're doing this kind of thing which is governed by certain kinds of rules. The intentional account is not thinking about assertion that way. It's not thinking that this is a certain kind of practice governed by rules. Rather, what it, the way it's thinking about it, fundamentally, is that assertion, we want to make sense of the fact that assertion is an attempt to communicate information. So we'll try to define assertion as an attempt to share information. To me, at least, this seems like a much more natural route to go in thinking about how to define assertion. Assertion does seem to be fundamentally a communicative thing, and I think it's natural that the, a definition of assertion reflect that. But before we close, it's worth noticing that this also has a nice explanation of the transmission of knowledge point. Because remember, we're saying that assertion is fundamentally an attempt to share information. One way to think about what that amounts to is transmission of knowledge. So the transmission of knowledge is not only explained by Williamson's account, but it's also adequately explained by the intentional account. And the reason why it's explained by the intentional account is because the fundamental thing that the intentional account wants to do is explain how assertions allow us to communicate information.